Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. It's wonderful to be online with you today. It would be even more wonderful to be in person with you today, but I'm grateful that we have a chance to connect again through our pop-up PD webinar series. And this, in fact, is the final pop-up PD for the 2021-22 fiscal year. And we hope that we'll be able to bring you more pop-up PD webinars in the near future. So as you can see, and, and the reason you signed up today was to talk and learn a little bit more about this concept of micro-credentials that we're hearing much more of in the educational landscape, not only in Ontario, but all over the place. So when we wrote the, the, uh, the workshop description, you know, we kind of phrased it in the, in the W5, who, what, when, where, why type approach. So we will address those different kinds of questions around who delivers and what do they deliver and where and so on. Um, and in a minute, I'll just share with you a little bit of the general organization of how we'll approach the webinar today and take care of a few housekeeping items as well. So as I just mentioned, this is the sixth of six pop-up PD webinars for this year. And I think many of you have probably attended others. And um, I just want to once again thank Contact North and Sarah Stalker for providing all of the technical assistance and access for us, and also working with our interpreters. I would like to welcome our two ASL interpreters today, Rebecca and Carolyn. So on the screen now is our just our little about pop-up PD screen that we show at every session. And you may want to note at the bottom, if you do have ideas for webinar topics, feel free to send an email. And we're always, always looking, looking for timely and interesting webinar topics as we soon, we hope, move into planning for next year. Briefly, this is an outline of how we're going to attack this topic today. Uh, we're just in the middle of number one, welcome and land acknowledgement. We'll talk a little bit about the many different definitions of micro-credentials and then kind of an internal Q&A about seven subtopics around micro-credentials. And then because this is such a huge and fast emerging topic, we'll take a little bit of a look, just a, just a few moments, on what's going on in some other parts of the world around micro-credentials, and then zone back in to what's going on in Ontario. And then we'll bring in a few little thoughts on LBS at the end, and of course, have questions and a summary at the end. I would encourage you to ask any questions throughout the webinar. I will keep an eye on the chat along with uh, my colleague Gay from Literacy Link Niagara and Heather from Quill Network, who are here today as our um, co-moderators and facilitators. So between us all, we will be happy to address and uh, direct our attention toward your questions if you would like to type anything into the chat. Just before we get into the actual agenda, I do want to mention that the topic of micro-credentials, and many of you probably are very much aware of this, it's a huge topic. It's very broad. So this is a largely informational webinar. I, um, you know, there's a couple of places where I'm, I'm going to ask you to type some thoughts into the chat, but I just want you to just be aware that there's a fair bit of information. I've tried to piece it together in a, in a you know, a coherent way. And you'll also see there's lots of sources that I have referenced throughout this webinar because there's so much information out there about micro-credentials. There was no need for me to try and create any more. It was best to go to some of the sources who are becoming experts in the field. So most of what I'm going to share with you today is really a compendium of a lot of different pieces of information that are out there about micro-credentials. Just as we get into the formal part of the webinar, I would like to begin by acknowledging the Indigenous peoples of all of the lands that we are on today. And we are on many different Indigenous lands across the province. While today we're meeting on a virtual platform, please let's just take a moment to acknowledge the importance of the lands which we each call home. 
We do this to reaffirm our commitment and responsibility in improving relationships between nations and to improving our own understanding, which is so important of our local indigenous peoples and their cultures. From coast to coast to coast, we acknowledge the ancestral and unceded territory of all the Inuit, Métis, and First Nations people that call this land home. So micro-credentials have been in the news and maybe you have seen a few things in the news about them. Uh, I pulled out a few articles, I'm gonna reference a couple of them at the beginning and one a little bit later on. And they are quite recent. This one is uh, from the Toronto Star, right as recently as December of, of last year. And it really is talking about, um, you know, what, what are some of the practical impacts of micro-credentials and this individual, who is um, interviewed for this article is actually someone, a recent grad from Teachers College doing his teacher training. And um, he decided to take a micro-credential in coding, as in um, computer coding. So one of his quotes from this article says, why not do it? Put it on my resume, incorporating it into my teaching practice as best I can. Education is headed toward these new ideas. So let's get on board. It could be the difference when it comes to getting a job. So by way of a bit of context, um, these first couple of slides are just meant to, to place my credentials in our minds a little bit in the way the public might be seeing them. We as educators may be seeing them in a different way, but a couple of nice examples of how the public might be seeing them. I also wanted to mention a uh, kind of a funny thing, given that we're all literacy educators, mostly on the call today. Micro-credentials, you will see it with the hyphen. You will see it without the hyphen as one word. And you'll see it as two separate words. Because as a newer term in the English language, um, and I'm not sure how it translates into other languages, uh, people are still trying to nail down what's the exact correct version. It actually reminds me of the term post-secondary because sometimes you see it with a hyphen, sometimes you see it written one way, or sorry, as one word. So they're not typos in here, but if, if the source listed it as one word, I just kept it as one word. This next article is from Maclean's, and it's a bit of a, as it says in the title, <clears throat> pardon me, a mini guide to the micro college course market. And I've just pulled a specific quote out of here that I'll read as well. Spanning a range of skills and industries, micro credentials cover everything from data literacy and computer aided design to reading blueprints and advanced wilderness first aid. Now, there's something I have not heard of, advanced wilderness first aid. Length is one major feature that distinguishes micro-credentials. We'll talk about lots of other features too, which run eight to about 200 hours from other types of courses, though some educators think that they, the way that they are assessed is the most important factor. We'll talk more about assessment later. How could we have an LBS pop-up PD and not talk about assessment? And a little quote from uh, Mishak Mwaba, who is the president and CEO of Bow Valley College in Alberta. He says, the fact that employer-defined competencies are used by post-secondary institutions in evaluating student performance is critical. Without authentic assessment, there is no micro-credential, says Mwaba. And a couple of you might actually remember Mishek. He was a dean at Niagara College, and I worked with him um, when I was at Niagara College. So it was really interesting to see him named and quoted in a couple of these articles that I, I wrote, sourced for this webinar. But the point being, his last statement, without authentic assessment, there is no micro-credential, is really a key feature that we'll look, look into a little bit more today. I apologize on a couple of these slides for the small print, but I did take a number of screenshots and sometimes it's therefore hard to 
make the print a little bigger, but I trust that you can see it well enough. So let's delve into this really big, somewhat open-ended question about what is a micro-credential. I'm going to share with you three or four definitions from different sources in Ontario. And we'll see that there's some common pieces and some slightly different pieces as we work through those definitions to start our session today. What are some of the words, and feel free to type into the chat. This is one of the places where I would invite you to share a thought if you wish to. When you think of micro-credentials, and there's no wrong or incorrect answers here, what are some of the words that come to, to mind to describe a micro-credential? We'll just pause for a moment here and, and see if anyone wants to type anything into the chat around that. Short program, module, condensed, short, quick, focused, timely, no frill, certification, short recognized course, short term training, short practical, ter short term practical courses, something short, great start, immediately applicable, industry specific, professional, short course with credit, you're popping in here so fast, I'm not even able to read them all out, but I know you'll be able to scroll through the chat and look. Mini course, short course with credit, PD, skills blast. I like that term, Bruce. Rapid training, certificate at the end based on practical skills. So maybe I, really, I don't really need to be at this webinar because I think you have a good idea of what micro-credentials are. Just kidding. Um, wonderful to see that we have some, some basis of knowledge and, and a little bit of familiarity in, in our audience today with, with what micro-credentials are. It's really hard to not have run across something to do with micro-credentials in this last couple of years if one is an educator at whatever level. So thanks for sharing those, um, those thoughts. And Jeff also added recognition, yes. I will share with you definitions from four organizations in Ontario, from the Ontario government, from the Higher Education Quality Council of Ontario, which we just fondly call HECO, based on the acronym, from eCampus Ontario, and also from our friends at Contact North. So as we work, walk through those definitions, just keep your eye out for some of those common phrases or features, some of which you identified in the chat, because there's definitely overlap, but it's interesting how the definitions are slightly different depending on the context, especially of the organization. And there's not any that are specifically wrong or right, they're just a little different. And I'll tell you about each organization very briefly so you understand their context. Of course, we understand the context of the Ontario government. This is their micro-credentials site, public facing. And currently the Ministry of Colleges and Universities, along with the Ministry of Labor Training and Skills Development, are embarking on a micro-credential strategy. I'll provide you with a little bit more information about the actual strategy at the end. But here's the government's definition. Micro-credentials are rapid training programs offered by post-secondary educational institutions across the province that can help you get the skills that employers need. Micro-credentials help people retrain and upgrade their skills to find new employment. Again, no judgments here, just providing some alternate definitions. Next, we have HECO. H-E-Q-C-O. And HECO is a government-funded organization. And I'm going to briefly read a statement that appears on their About Us portion of the website. HECO was created through the Higher Education Quality Council of Ontario Act 2005. So they're a legislated organization. HECO is an agency of the Ontario government that brings evidence-based research to the continued improvement of the post-secondary education system in Ontario. 
So Heckel's got a lot of irons in the fire when it comes to micro-credentials. Here's their definition, a little bit different from the government. So micro-credential is a representation of learning awarded for completion of a short program that is focused on a discrete set of competencies, skills, knowledge, attributes, and is sometimes related to other credentials. So interesting in Heckel's definition because they bring in the notion of um, micro-credentials sometimes relating to other credentials, which is very true. Next up on our definitions stage is eCampus Ontario. eCampus is also a government funded organization in Ontario. And to read a little bit about them, just a sentence of, about their about statement. eCampus Ontario is a provincially funded nonprofit organization that leads a consortium of the province's publicly funded colleges, universities, and Indigenous institutes to develop and test online learning tools to advance the use of educational technology and digital learning environments. So that's the sentence, it's in fairly small print there at the bottom. So what eCampus Ontario has to say is the following. A micro-credential is a certification of assessed learning associated with a specific and relevant skill or competency. Micro-credentials enable rapid retraining and augment traditional education through pathways into regular post-secondary programming. So interesting to see uh, these three different definitions and we will we'll share Contact North's definition a little bit later. So what, what are some of the common features that you saw in those definitions? And some of them might be the same things as you typed into the chat, but feel free to type in again if, if anything different struck you or just some of the things you saw repeated in those definitions as they came across your screen. Again, rapid training, competency-based. The word training appears often. Skills-based enhanced learning needed by employers. Learning new skills connected to post-secondary, assessed, yes. So that kind of builds on some of the things that people typed into the chat earlier in terms of what you were already aware of with micro-credentials. And um, some of these common features, credential training, discrete relating to size, absolutely. I, I pulled out a few, some of which you have mentioned and listed them here. So one thing that they didn't talk too much about, except for I think it was the HECO definition, was that notion of building on other credentials, which we, we talk about as being stackable. Lisa says, focus on post-secondary and omission of others. That's an interesting comment, Lisa, because it's true that in Ontario, the focus right now on micro-credentials in terms of government funding is toward post-secondary institutions, while we know in reality that many other organizations also deliver micro-credentials. And we'll address that a little bit more shortly as well. So thanks for mentioning that in the chat as well, Lisa. So our friends at Contact North have a micro-credential, um, a number of micro-credential articles on their site. And interestingly, one way that they start their definition is that there is no absolute definition for micro-credentials in Canada or anywhere else. These, are com these components are, however, widely recognized as key characteristics of micro-credentials. And I'll share what those key characteristics are in a minute. But first of all, I wanna take a minute for anyone that's not familiar with Contact North to just introduce who they are, just as I introduced ECHO and eCampus Ontario. So Contact North has been around for quite a long time. And although it's not appearing on your screen, my one or two sentence description from their about page is as follows. 
as Ontario's community-based bilingual distance education and training network, Contact North, Contact Nord, helps underserved residents in 1,300 small, rural, remote, Indigenous and Francophone communities access education and training without leaving their communities. If you've been around as long as I am, you'll remember some of the Contact North audio and video conferencing classrooms that appeared in many of our <laughs> schools, colleges, universities. You might have taken courses. I know I took courses through the Contact North network many years ago. And so moving with the times, of course, Contact North has um, also moved into the realm of supporting more online delivery. They don't offer courses, but they are a technology support provider. And you might also be familiar with Contact North as the LBS eChannel support organization. And in terms of LBS, Contact North also is the host of the OALCF repository where our culminating tasks and milestones are stored. So Contact North has a big significant role in LBS as well. So back to their nice summary of micro-credential features. And theirs is not so much a definition, but rather a set of points. A skills and competency-based focus for learning rather than time. Short and focused on a narrow range of skills and competencies. Competency is assessed as a demonstrable skill or behavior varying across micro-credentials. Well, obviously it would vary because the micro-credentials are hugely varied. Quality is assured through peer and industry review, back to the concept of industry support. And of course, industry recognized because many micro-credentials are co-developed with industry or employer partners or industry organizations. I'd like to direct you to this teachonline.ca um, site on Contact North's main website. And they have a number of, as I mentioned before, different articles, webinars, recorded sessions around micro-credentials, among many other things. But I especially wanted to draw your attention to this article, 10 Facts You Need to Know About Micro-Credentials. Because in fact, a, a fair bit of the content in some of the slides that you'll see from here on in are drawn from this article. It's a really nice read. It takes maybe about 10 minutes to read through it. And it's really an excellent um, introduction to micro-credentials. And that's why I, I decided to pull a lot of pieces out of it for today's session. And the link is here, but you can go to teachonline.ca and you can just type micro-credentials into the chat or into the search, sorry, and you will come up with uh, links to many of their micro-credential articles. So we've talked a lot about the what and the definition and the different features of micro-credentials. So we'll, we'll talk a little bit about a few examples right from our own um, country and our province. They're not exhaustive, just a little bit of a, a taste of some examples of micro-credentials that are, that are currently around. And I want to go back once more to a, a short article to give a little more context again to what some of the public facing pieces around micro-credentials are telling us. So this is a Financial Post article referencing tech companies who want workers faster. So they're designing their own micro-credentials. Some tech companies and others design their micro-credentials internally. Others design them with colleges and universities because that tends to give them broader applicability and perhaps broader enrollment. And of course, the tech sector is one where micro-credentials really have been around for quite a long time. Just short little pieces of skill-based training to help tech and IT workers stay current in their fields. Similar manufacturing sector as well, because tech changes often happen fairly quickly in manufacturing. So just briefly, the traditional education system, reading off of the quote here, and the digital economy were operating at different speeds. The issue pushed CEO Guillaume Bazinet to come up with a solution that is being echoed in many post-secondary institutions across the country. Industry players are helping universities and colleges design 
programs and micro credentials to ensure students are up to date with the skills or software that are in vogue in the sector. Doesn't mean it's only colleges and universities delivering them, but there are more and more of those partnerships between industry and post-secondary institutions to deliver, to develop and deliver micro credentials. Barb, I just wanted to flag that Lisa made a very interesting comment in chat. Thank you. I'll just look at that. The industry buy-in piece is critical as employers are still hanging their hat on grade 12, OSSD, GED, et cetera. They sure are, Lisa, which we all know can mean a variety of skills and competencies. If industry doesn't recognize micro-credentials, there's almost no reason to have them in LBS. Exactly. And, you know, I, I think that is a very timely and astute comment, Lisa. We all know that we can provide different sources of upskilling and upgrading and some very employer-driven training in LBS that will really stand up well for our, for our learners when they get into employment. And just having that piece of paper with a, you know, the old traditional grade 12 OSSD or GED or A certificate or whatever it is just doesn't necessarily cut it. So thanks for that comment, Lisa. Here's a little example from Mohawk College. Yes, I'm in from the college sector. I, um, I'm not trying to put a plug in for the colleges today, but it's, it's just true that in Ontario, a lot of development is going on at the colleges and universities around micro-credentials. And so I wanted to draw your attention to a little bit of it. This is a nice um, little um, statement about Mohawk College's view of micro-credentials. And I like their comment at the end, some micro-credentials are stackable and can be combined to lead to a larger clustered credential. We, we will, um, that keeps infusing itself into some of our discussion today. And just a couple of examples of what Mohawk is offering. I just pulled off of their website. Here's a micro-credential in foot care management. And as you can read, it's designed for RNs, registered nurses, or RPNs, registered practical nurses, as an additional qualification that they could use in their practice. And then completely changing gears, I pulled out another example of remotely piloted aircraft system ground school. So do you want to know how to operate a drone? There's a micro-credential for that. And of course, linked to industry, prepares learners to challenge the Transport Canada basic or advanced drone operator exam. Who knew? Another quick example, uh, Ontario Tech University, formerly known as University of Ontario Institute of Technology. They're delving deeply into micro-credentials as well. And I like their definition a portable communication tool that represents evidence of your skills for employers, educators, and peers. So I'll pause there for a moment, and then we'll talk a little bit more in more detail about some of the features of micro-credentials, which I've arranged around seven subtopics. Checking the chat, don't see anything else in there just now. Can we just take a moment to switch interpreters? Of course, perfect time. Great, thank you. Okay. Perfect, thanks, Rebecca, here we go. All right, so, some, some subtopics. We can talk a little about the target audience. And we've touched on a few of these things um, as we've been discussing so far. Who develops micro-credentials? How are they delivered? How are they assessed? How are they documented? We hear a lot about badges, so we should touch on a little bit of information about badges. And then of course, coming back to the term stackable again, which we've addressed a few times today. I'm just checking the time as well here. So it's 2.30, okay. And we're almost halfway through this in terms of the slides. So that I think our timing is, is going well today. Always bad when, when a presenter says that and then everything goes off the rails.
So the who. You could probably have, have told me this. I'm summarizing it for the benefit of anybody that might not be quite as familiar with micro-credentials. Obviously, people who are unemployed or laid off can access micro-credentials to a really good advantage. Probably more so in some sectors than others. We also work in LBS and in other areas with lots of underemployed individuals who want or need to upskill. I see there's a typo there. It should say upskill, not upskills, uh, to improve their job opportunities. And then an interesting one that I hadn't really thought of, but makes perfect sense, is this third one that I came across in some of the research was that, of course, in the in the current economy, we there are so many more contract and short-term workers than there ever were before, either because they choose to work in that form or just because it is harder to get long-term permanent full-time jobs in this current economy and in this current labor market. So for contract workers or on-call workers, casual workers who wanna learn new skills, enhance themselves so they have greater capacity as a contractor, certainly micro-credentials could help them as well. Who develops them? So we have touched on this, a little bit of a recap. Obviously, colleges, universities, institutes, other training providers, the education sector develops them. So do professional associations. And some of these have been around for a very long time. For example, the Institute of Management Accountants. They have, a, they have their own micro-credentials. Lots of companies and employers have micro-credentials either available internally as part of their own in-house training program, or possibly available to people like you and I who might want to engage with their micro-credentials. And then a fourth area of development is with the MOOCs, as, as they're called, the Massive Open Online Courses. And many of them have some kind of a certica certification attached to them. Lisa says, MCs, micro-credentials are great for folks who are working full-time and can't take months off to go back to school. Yes. And they're a lot cheaper when it comes to the tuition. So if we, just on this topic of who develops them, um, think back to early years of Microsoft. Microsoft has had certifications that any of us could have taken over the years. There was, you know, we still can. Um, I remember A plus certification in the tech sector. We can even think of things like SmartServe and WIMIS and FallArrest and AODA compliance, some of the things we do in our own organizations or even um, have done ourselves for some of our jobs. So those are some really early examples of micro of uh, industry specific micro credentials. They've just taken off because of the way both the economy and the labor market are currently developing. And, you know, to go back to Lisa's point, because some traditional certifications don't necessarily give employers what they want or need in their employees. And I think that goes even beyond talking about a high school diploma or a GED or an A certificate. It also refers to um, some post-secondary programs where people don't necessarily always, in fact, often don't learn um, more hands-on skills that employers are looking for. I see Gabriana asked if, oh, I'm gonna pause here and go to the chat. How MOOCs recognize, some are and some aren't. It depends on who's developed and offered the MOOC. Um, Denise comments that the Microsoft Word 2016 online free tutorials have been extremely beneficial to many of my learners. Yep, that's a good point, Denise. I think many of us have been able to help our learners access those. There's, there's so many good free tutorials around digital skills now, not just with Microsoft, but with other providers as well. <laughs> okay, Lisa, I'm laughing with you, not at you, with your comment in the chat. But look where you are now. There you go. Okay, let's move along here. 
Our uh, third feature, how are they delivered? Well, I think you're probably where many micro-credentials are delivered fully online. And I would probably say the majority because that's part of what the desirable features of a micro-credential is the fact that it can be often accessed online. Some topics don't lend themselves obviously to online delivery. And you know, you could think of um, micro-credentials that relate to construction, to manufacturing, to healthcare. Some of those obviously need to ha probably have an in-person or hands-on component. Uh, some do have hybrid delivery of micro-credentials. And some may require perhaps in-person assessment. So, you know, there's a big, big mix of how they're delivered, but the majority, I would say, are, are, are currently fully online with perhaps just a small in-person component in some cases. And as we've all seen in LBS in this last few years, or well, what are we now, two years, um, there's a lot of people that are not comfortable working online and learning online, but there are a lot who are. So micro-credentials can often help those folks who, who are comfortable and have the digital skills to engage with online micro-credentials. We spoke briefly about assessment and just the fact that it, it, it has to be uh, in micro-credentials. It must address what the learner can do, not how much time is spent learning. So it's a competency model, not a, a time-based model. And clearly that sometimes requires a really different view of assessment. And I, I say this especially for post-secondary institutions um, and no disrespect at all to our university colleagues, but I think the mind shift is perhaps the most challenging in the university sector to look at the type of assessment and competency-based assessment that's needed in um, assessing micro-credentials to make sure they are delivering what they say they're delivering and to make sure that the learner is acquiring what the micro-credential is actually all about. I think, um, I think back to something that I know we're all familiar with. Think about um, CPR first aid training. Well, it, I, I'm, I'm betting many, if not all of us on this call today have attended CPR first aid training with St. John's Ambulance or another organization. Well, we never thought of that as a micro-credential 20 or 30 or 40 years ago, but really it is. And it would be really hard to assess online only or through paper and pen if I can resuscitate somebody with CPR. So again, I think that's a really concrete example of a micro-credential where one has to demonstrate one's skill in order to achieve the competencies. So the, the way that micro-credentials are documented is a little bit of an interesting discussion. And I will say it's evolving in Ontario and in Canada right now. So for the most part, the intention is that a micro-credential or a badge, and we'll talk about badges in a minute, can actually be posted to a learner's digital wallet or e-portfolio. So, so they're, they're intended to be not necessarily a paper-based evidence of completion, but a digital evidence of completion. And just like we all control access to our own wallets with money in them, we as learners would also control access to our digital wallet or e-portfolio. And the deposits that are made into the digital wallet are the completed micro-credentials or badges that we earn. So in Canada, our post-secondary institutions, colleges, universities, indigenous institutes have agreed to start trying to move toward using digital micro-credential credentials. Some post-secondary institutions are now having the capacity and the ability to actually record micro-credentials on a post-secondary transcript. I will say that's not very common yet, but I think we'll see more of that. 
a nice interesting feature about the digital wallet is that I, as say a, a job seeker, I can take pieces in and out of my digital wallet so that when I present it to an employer, I can make sure that the, my most relevant badges or micro credentials are there for that employer. I can also take out outdated ones. So it's, it's a repository, but it stays with the learner. I learned a little bit about this in my research for this session, about how our badge is different from micro-credentials. So micro-credentials, as we've been talking about this whole time, really are all linked back to an approved or accepted set of standards or competencies, largely driven by employers or by industry need. They're usually and really have to be taught by a teacher or facilitator or mentor who is actually accountable for ensuring that the people, the students, the learners in that micro-credential are learning what you say they're going to learn and they can demonstrate their learning in order to be awarded the micro-credential. Badges are a little less formal. I'm going to pop over to the chat here. I see Lisa's posted this. My first experience with badging slash digital credentials was North Star Digital. They had a badge that could be posted to Mozilla, which I thought was pretty cool. I know LinkedIn has something similar. Yes, LinkedIn Learning does have a lot of um, micro-credentials embedded in their, in their organization now as well. I'm familiar with North Star Digital, Lisa, and I agree that there's a lot of um, really nice things available through North Star as well. Interesting that could be posted to Mozilla. I myself am not, I don't have a digital wallet. I don't have an e-portfolio. I probably will at some point, but um, I'm kind of interested in that concept and learning more about it. So badges really are a little more informal. And this is a direct quote from the article I mentioned earlier um, from Contact North, that um, badges can be awarded informally for anything by anyone. There is, no, there is value in learning a specific skill or knowledge related to the badge. So the credential piece of micro-credentials is um, partly what distinguishes it from a badge. And Barb, the interpreters will just switch. Okay, I'll pause for a second there. Good, that's a good time. when you're ready. Okay, thank you. I see Stephanie's posted in the chat. Our agency has a badge from Census Canada for being a community partner. Nice. That's a really neat thing that Stephanie had not heard of that before. Love learning these new little tidbits about some of the, the things that are available. Um, okay, moving along. I'm, I, I learned something else about badges. And that is that, and, and perhaps I should have known this or should have assumed to know it, the badge actually contains data about the credential. So it's not just a picture that is posted in your e-wallet. It contains information such as the criteria that you met, like what are you now competent in? Where did you receive the badge? What is the alignment to any professional standards or industry standards that might exist? And when does it expire? Because some credentials, like for going back to the St. John's Ambulance CPR first aid example, that expires after a certain length of time. So this data that's inside the badge is called metadata, and it's actually very easy for employers to access it if they're looking at an e-portfolio, because they can click on the badge and they can see this information. That was one of my new learnings.
And Summer's asking, do you need a badge reader to access that data? I actually don't know that the answer to that, Summer, because I don't have any badges that I can try to read. <laughs> Does anyone else know the answer to that? If so, feel free to type it into the chat. Really, it's an interesting question, Summer. So then our seventh of seven subtopics is the notion of stackable credentials. And I'm just pausing for a moment to make sure my connection is still going strong here. I'm assuming so. I haven't seen any messages in the chat otherwise. I was having a little bit of connectivity issue earlier. Thanks, Sarah, for confirming that I'm okay. Um, so what does stackable mean? Well, kind of really what it exactly what you think it means. It means that you can take, ideally take micro credentials and bundle them together or stack them up one on top of the other to either get a bigger micro credential or to lead toward a certificate or to get advanced standing in perhaps a post-secondary college certificate diploma program or a university degree. So the notion of micro-credentials being stackable and, and bundled together is a really important piece of um, sort of the usefulness of them. What's kind of interesting also is that some post-secondary institutions are actually pulling courses out of their um, say a certificate diploma degree program, and then delivering them as micro credentials and perhaps packaging two or three of them together to make a, a mini credential. And then if a student, a learner decides, hey, I'd like to take that full program at the post-secondary institution, then they've got a leg up because they have already taken a couple of courses that, are, that have been pulled out as micro credentials, but that will count toward their post-secondary learning. Some, you know, many may never use it for that purpose, but it is a concept around micro-credentials that, um, that I think can help lead some learners who wish to pursue more than just a micro-credential into post-secondary education. I'm guessing that employers also do it that way too. They probably have, obviously, micro-credentials that they've created for their staff and their employees that can be bundled together to get additional in-house certifications. And I'll, I'll tell you about a couple of examples of those a little bit later on. So let's switch gears a bit here and talk just a little bit more about the broader picture of micro-credentials. I think it's always important when we're, you know, as educators that we try to keep educating ourselves not only about what's happening in our backyards, but being aware with some of these really broad issues and topics about what's going on in, in some parts of the rest of the world too especially if we in our jurisdictions aren't necessarily leaders and we might be able to learn from jurisdictions that are leaders. So with that in mind, we'll, we'll take a little bit of a tour of a few places in the world where micro-credentials are perhaps a bit further down the road than we are. I would say as a preview that one of the very most... Um, most advanced countries when it comes to micro-credentials is New Zealand. So New Zealand was really fast out of the gate in terms of uh, their work with micro-credentials. They, they were obviously spent a considerable amount of time planning ahead and they have an interesting model because they have a national standards what they call the New Zealand Qualification Authority that is responsible for maintaining the standards of their micro-credentials. And they have their own little definition of micro-credential in that it certifies achievement of a coherent set of skills and knowledge, I like coherent in there, specified by a statement of purpose, learning outcomes, and strong evidence of need by industry, employers, and or the community. 
all of the same things we've been saying, but just worded a bit differently. I'll just pause there for a moment and go back to the chat for a second and see if we have an answer to uh, Summer's question. So I think Lisa weighed in on that. It depends, some are open badges, which are readable with either a click or some other re basic read. Others are closed and need other type. Okay, thanks for that, uh, Lisa. And I see Summer's posed another question in the chat, so we'll see if anybody can help with that one as well. Oh, that's a nice link. I, I, I thank you for posting that as well, Lisa. Openbadges.org, I'll have to consult that myself. So moving back to New Zealand here for a minute. They had their 100th birthday of their 100th micro-credential being approved in 2020. And here on the screen now, I'll let you read those for yourself. It's just some examples of um, some of the micro-credentials in their 100 or so nationally recognized and nationally developed micro-credentials. Quite a, quite a variety of examples there. I think that's interesting. The chainsaw use in forestry one um, really <laughs> brings me back as, as somebody living in Northern Ontario to, gosh, 30 years ago when I first came to Northern Ontario and um, sawmill operator was a program that many of our upgrading students went into because the forest industry, forestry industry was very big here at the time. And they were essentially doing micro-credentials in, um, in logging and forestry techniques way back then, but nobody ever called them micro-credentials. Lisa made a great comment uh, that you might want to see, Barb. Okay, thanks. I'll have a look there. I just have to scroll. I lost my spot in the chat. I have to scroll down a bit. Do, 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 do. All right. Nice, the list is excellent and has LBS written all over it. That's good to hear. Gabriana comments as well. Digital literacy is a popular one in Canada, though digital skills are needed in all industries now. Absolutely. And haven't we not seen evidence of that over and over and over again? in this last couple of years. So moving on just to, in, our, in our world tour, <laughs> a little bit of information on the European Union. So they are as a whole group of countries, which is obviously even more challenging, trying to pull together some micro-credentials research and implement a strategy by 2025. And you can see some of their characteristics of micro-credentials that they're trying to achieve. And their sort of purpose statement at the bottom that those that their strategy is intended to boost adult learning, higher education institutions will offer short courses in a comparable manner, ensuring agreed upon quality standards and facilitating recognition and portability. Again, not really anything different than what we've been hearing, but it's interesting that the EU, the European Union is attempting to do this as a whole. And then briefly, just our neighbors to the south, um, you know, huge country, huge population. They have a very complex landscape around um, A, education and B, micro-credentials. They have academic providers delivering micro-credentials, colleges, universities, schools, et cetera, institutes. They have non-academic providers, just like we do here in Canada, industry associations, professional associations, uh, nonprofits, etc. And just a few examples. Um, for example, at the State University of New York, there are now 400 micro credentials available at 27 campuses in 60 or more disciplines. That's that's huge. Another example from University of Denver, private university offering uh, three micro credentials in coding, teaching excellence, and high performance leadership. 
And there are literally hundreds of thousands of micro-credential type offerings in the States at this time. Looking at Gabriana's comment in the chat, um, the EU strategy also enhances access. Yes, it does, absolutely. So let's talk a bit closer to home here. We're not quite as far down the road as some other jurisdictions, but a few examples of universities that are getting on board with micro-credentials, University of Toronto, as you can see, and Royal Roads University. Some examples there. Camosun College in British Columbia. Bow Valley College in Alberta. So across the country, there are many, many post-secondary institutions going down this, the road of micro-credentials. And we'll zone in a little bit more on Ontario shortly as well. I wanted to draw your attention to this particular set of guiding principles with respect to the Canadian landscape for micro-credentials. This set of guiding principles has been developed by SICAN, which is Colleges and Institutes Canada, got their little logo at the, at the top there. So SICAN is a body that um, helps to coordinate to whatever extent possible post-secondary institutions across all of Canada. And so to their credit, they have endeavored to create some guiding principles in consultation with the post-secondary sector around micro-credentials. And I won't read them all out, but I'll leave them up on the screen there for just a moment so that you can read through them. And they really do encapsulate a lot of the features and characteristics that we've been talking about already today. While you're having just a quick read through that screen, I'll take a look in the chat. Sarah's posted the survey evaluation or the webinar evaluation. If you do have to leave before the end, please, please do um, provide us with your feedback. It really helps us to improve and, and know how we can do even better with our pop-up PD. And we will place the evaluation in the chat again later. Bruce raised a question, if not yet mentioned, what are the typical minimum entry requirements in taking a micro-credential? Excellent question, Bruce. It does vary a lot because it, it so depends on the nature of the micro-credential. A lot of them, I would say, don't have any prior knowledge requirements, but some that are more industry-specific industry would likely require some prior knowledge. So there isn't sort of a, a hard and fast way to say, oh, everybody requires this or everybody requires high school or everybody requires something else. It's very uh, varied. But yeah, excellent question. So I'll move on from the guiding principles just in the interest of keeping pace here today. So let's focus in a little bit on some of the, the more specific trends and next steps in Ontario. For example, the micro-credential strategy that the government of Ontario is undertaking. I'll just uh, outline a few features of that. So our government has invested 59.5 million over three years to create our first micro-credential strategy. And a couple of the features of it are as follows. Creating an online portal to access micro-credential training opportunities. Well, that's a big, a big deal to try and kind of get, oops, sorry, I went too fast, to try and get across Canada micro-credentials um, into an online portal. They've also created funding to help promote the development of new micro-credentials. And those might be ones that are responding to regional labor market needs, partnerships, um, and that is that has been distributed through a call for proposal. So lots of educational organizations and employers and um, professional associations have been able to access some of that funding already.
A couple of the other features of the, the micro-credential strategy in Ontario is a public awareness campaign to, pro to promote micro-credentials. I don't think we've really seen that rolled out yet. I find the, the second one quite interesting, expanding the Ontario Student Assistance Program, OSAP, to include um, students enrolled in, in a particular set of ministry approved micro-credential programs. So that's a great boost because even though micro-credentials are less expensive because they're smaller, there is still a cost associated. So the fact that um, learners may be able to access OSAP for some micro-credentials is I think a real boost and a very positive thing. And then the third one goes back to our discussions about the virtual passport or, or e-portfolio or digital wallet um, that uh, you know, is a way to track the micro-credentials and badges that somebody has completed. And so part of the government's micro-credential strategy is around working with eCampus Ontario and others to develop this virtual passport or wallet, whatever name you wanna give it, to track a person's learning experiences. Thanks, Tracy, as you have to leave. So we're glad that you could join us today and thanks for doing the evaluation. You're very welcome, Mark. Thanks for your comment in the chat. So a little further about trends in Ontario, I'm gonna check the time again. So we're at 3.03, so we have, um, about, about a half hour left. We'll go back just for a second to our HECO organization. Um, sorry, it was just glancing back at the chat again. Yes, Stephanie. <laughs> Stephanie mentions how her privacy senses are tingling at the tracking idea. Yeah. I, I don't think the attention to privacy can be overstated when it comes to tracking anything that we do. So the HECO Making Sense of Micro-Credentials report in May um, was a research report and it looked at um, kind of some, some issues around awareness and views of micro-credentials. And so not surprisingly, it identified that there's not, 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 a, not a lot of information yet out there, low rates of awareness among prospective students and employers about micro-credentials. And then in terms of employer feedback, I thought this was a great statement that they were rated most favorably the features of micro-credentials as directly related to the job being applied for, that they're competency-based and they're accredited. So again, these get to right to the root of what a micro-credential is. So let's just take a quick look at our backyard again, just around some things that are happening in our colleges. Since we, you know, LBS is delivered in the college sector, we all have connections to the colleges and the communities where we, where we deliver LBS. Again, they are certainly not the only providers by any means of micro-credentials, but I'll just show you a few more examples. We already saw the Western region example in Mohawk earlier, so I won't show you that again. Um, I actually at the last minute swapped out Humber for Centennial College. So you're not going to see anything about Humber. You're going to see a quick little something about Centennial. And here it is. I've just made some screenshots of the web pages from a couple of these colleges. And they have their micro-credentials listed on this page. Advanced manufacturing and automation culinary back to basics, manufacturing and production. So again, these are ones obviously that would be in demand in Centennial's area, which happens to be the east end of Toronto. But since they're mostly online, it certainly doesn't stop anyone from somewhere else in the province taking them. And thank you, Jennifer, for posting an article um, in the chat. Just looking at the link there. Thank you, that sounds like a great one to read as well. Quick example from Durham College, they have a micro-credential in graphic design, Photoshop, and Illustrator. And you can read a little bit at the bottom of that slide about what, the, um, what that micro-credential addresses. Basically works in Adobe Creative Suite. So again, a fairly narrow zone of um, expertise that's attached to this micro-credential, as is the intention.
Another one from Durham is using construction tools, micro-credential. Extremely employer-driven, as you can see by the description. And I can imagine how great that would look on a resume or an e-portfolio for, say, an entry-level uh, construction worker. Would probably give them a, a leg up on somebody that doesn't have that, not to mention being safer in the workplace. From our friends at Northern College, whose main campus is in Timmins, but have, oh gosh, I'd say at least nine other sites around Northern Ontario. One of their micro-credentials is legal office assistant. And this one I picked in particular because it's a nice example of that pathway and the ability to stack a micro-credential. And if you see at the bottom of the screen, there is a description there that, um, Students who have oh, lean over, successfully completed the courses below in this micro-credential can continue into our Office Administration General One-Year Certificate Program or the Law Clerk Program, which is a two-year diploma. So this is a nice example of someone who might start out doing a micro-credential, might decide that they either have the time, the motivation, the job opportunities to pursue something more, and they have a bit of a leg up on that post-secondary program because they've already done this micro-credential. Judy asks, within the context of micro-credential, what does accredited mean? Accrediting is the, really the person issuing the micro-credential, the organization issuing the micro-credential. And so it has to be, I mean, I suppose anyone can say that they're accrediting it, but in the Ontario landscape, it could be a college, a university, an employer association, an industry association. It could probably be a school board. If they went down the road of doing micro-credentials and maybe some are um, for some, aspects of their delivery. So accredited means it, it's not just something that someone thought would be a good idea, but someone from industry and or an employer are agreeing and an organization that has the ability to accredit it is, is accrediting it. So Here's one from St. Lawrence College in Kingston, cybersecurity. I'm just fascinated by the range of different micro-credentials that are out there. I had to kind of stop myself from scrolling through some of the different sites to, to look at these because there's, there's really a fascinating mix. This is an interesting one I know, especially around the cost, it's $98. So there are four modules, $98 each. So for about $400, which I would never dispute, that's a lot of money for many people but compared to a one semester tuition for a college or university program, $400 for four modules isn't too bad. And thank you, Sarah, for pointing that out in the chat that we do have a current list of Ontario micro-credentials at um, the link you've provided. Thank you for adding that. That's a great resource as well. So we have talked a little bit here and there about you know, injecting a, a thought or two about LBS, but as we work toward wrapping up for today, let's talk just a little bit very briefly about, um, about LBS, since we are all, for the most part, LBS educators. And I'd be interested in your thoughts. Again, feel free to type into the chat around this question. Can we help to promote the micro-credential strategy in Ontario? I don't think any of us would really disagree that the micro-credential strategy is a bad one, but I would like to know, you know, what are your thoughts? I have some thoughts about how we might be able to help. I'll give you a minute to think about that, and I'll just stop talking and take a drink of water and see if anyone would like to type in anything into the chat around that. Jacqueline says, yes, with an exclamation mark. Yes, we can help. Okay. 
If you have any thoughts on how we can help, feel free to type those in as well. Gives my voice two minutes to rest also. I see some comments coming in the chat. Many thanks. I will highlight a few of those now. I, I realize you can all read them. Julie's comment, um, interesting, some of the micro-credentials I've looked at our courses or programs we already offer at no cost. It's true. I'm going to make my chat a bit bigger here so I can scroll through it a little more easily. Lots of great comments coming in here. Sarah asks a question, are micro-credentials typically aimed at a post-secondary level? Maybe, maybe not, really depends on the nature of it. Again, if you think of a micro-credential as something like um, CPR first aid, you definitely don't need to be at a post-secondary level to take something, a micro-credential of that nature. So it really depends on what kind of micro-credential it is. Certainly some are absolutely probably require um, post-secondary readiness to take them, but I would certainly not say all of them by any means. But the converse of that is yes, somebody who is college ready probably can handle a micro-credential, but they may not have the industry experience to do so because really those micro-credentials are tied to, to, to jobs and if it's an entry-level micro-credential, perhaps they do have the, the capacity. If it's a, an industry-related micro-credential, say in manufacturing, that might require some prior knowledge, maybe that person wouldn't be ready. Jacqueline mentions that through LBS, we can create our own, if possible, micro-credentials and, ref and referring opportunities. And by referral opportunities, yes, I think that's key, being able to be aware of micro-credentials and be able to refer our learners to them if some are appropriate for that. Encouraging learners to take them, yep. Lisa mentions many of them have no academic prerequisites, that's right. LBS can in many areas prep folks academically to be able to work online, provide space and tutoring assistance depending on the speed of learning. There's a lot of ways of many levels that we can and should assist. I totally agree, Lisa, I think that, that there's a, lot, there's a lot that we can do through LBS, just through our existing you know, um, framework of delivery to help people who are interested in pursuing micro-credentials. Clearly, one does need some literacy skills to, to um, pursue a micro-credential. So it's another way of preparing students for something, preparing learners for something. Um, be great if offered through Ontario Works. Yeah, it'll be, and Denise, I'm assuming you mean that some micro-credentials could be funded through Ontario Works. Um, sharing the value in taking them. Jeff mentions workplace or workforce literacy micro-credentials. Yep, interesting idea. Evan, maybe break some of our larger courses down into micro-credential length courses. Yeah, all good ideas. I'm just scrolling through and it's so interesting to read everybody's posts. And in the interest of time, I will not um, read every post, but I'll just scroll through them so I have an idea of what's going on here in the chat. Evelyn, it's a great way to have people think about education as small bites, yep, that are manageable for sure. 
Heather mentions promoting micro-credentials as the next steps in preparing learners to succeed. Same as LVS offers pre-apprenticeship prep. Yep, you can offer, you can really prep people to do just about anything in LBS. And this has definitely garnered a lot of interesting comments in the chat. So again, I'm just going to um, take a moment, scroll through them, pick out a few highlights. But thank you so much for putting in a really large number of interesting ideas. Way more than I could have even thought of, that's for sure. And I'm still scrolling, just catching up. A couple of people have to head out. So once again, um, Heather's posted the evaluation survey in the chat. And then Shannon mentioned a moment ago, having a list of free on of free ones and encourage learners to engage with them. Absolutely. And Lisa also mentions the concept of sharing, that's for sure. So I'm gonna look at just a few more slides today. And I know a few people are, um, are heading out. So thank you. And again, if you need to leave, please do fill out our evaluation. Very briefly, here's a few things that crossed my mind that you have also mentioned in the chat. We can provide learners information. We can help to prepare learners if they're interested. And, and really, preparing for a micro-credential could apply to any of the five goal paths, given the huge range of micro-credentials that are out there. So we have how much time left? Really just want to leave a little bit of time for questions. So I think that we can pause there. And we do have a few minutes left if there's any questions that we haven't addressed um, through the course of the presentation. And just by way of a, a summary, I'll end with these last couple of slides. And again, have to give credit once more to that um, excellent Contact North article, 10 Facts You Need to Know About Micro-Credentials. So I think these last couple of slides really encompass a lot of what we've talked about today. Micro-credentials are personalized with the right combination to meet someone's needs. They're modular and stackable. Sometimes it might just be a one-off learning experience while some are created to be stacked and ladder to create a qualification, equally good either way. Micro-credentials ideally are shareable because they're placed in that digital wallet so that employers or other educational institutions can access them. And then, as I mentioned earlier, in Ontario, at least, the post-secondary institutions are, um, are indicating that they would like micro-credentials to actually be able to appear on a transcript, which takes some doing because those, those wheels and cogs in big institutions work um, are fairly complex when it comes to what goes on a transcript. So thank you. Thank you for attending today. Again, I think Sarah or Heather is going to repost the evaluation link in the chat. I'm going to just go back to the chat for a moment and catch up on some comments or any last minute items. And I also want to take a moment as we're wrapping up to let you know again, if you are looking for resources for any of the pop-up PD sessions, you can access them at the eChannel site. And really, if you type, even if you just Google eChannel pop-up PD, it will take you to that link. Uh, thanks for all the positive comments in the chat. I'm really glad that we were able to get together today and uh, spend some time talking about micro-credentials. It's such a current topic. And, um, you know, I thought I knew a little bit about them. Now I think I know a little bit more. And I hope that you've also had an opportunity to gain some knowledge today. I would very much like to thank um, all of the members of our pop-up PD committee. Contact North, of course, Sarah Stocker, 
the face of our technical support. So thank you, Sarah, for um, your technical support today and always. Deaf Literacy Initiative has provided our ASL interpretation today. So we very much thank Rebecca and Carolyn for uh, interpreting today. And in fact, Deborah, er, Rebecca and Carolyn have been interpreting through all of our pop-up PD, which is wonderful. COFA will be translating the webinar for the Francophone agencies. And so a big thanks to them as well. It takes a bit of time, obviously, for that translation to happen, but it will, it will happen. And then also our pop-up PD partners that you can see listed below, some of the regional networks and other support organizations like the CSC who will come together to develop our pop-up PD sessions. And thank you again for the co positive comments in the chat. I really appreciate your efforts to, to share and to type things into the chat. Because again, I know it was, an, as I said, it's kind of an information heavy session. So I'm, a, I'm really appreciative of the comments in the chat and the level of interaction we were able to have, even though we're not in the same room. Imagine what we could have done if we were in the same room. Um, Lisa's mentioned a very timely discussion. I can't even keep up with all the comments in the chat now, so I won't even try, but I will read them all as we wrap up today. Some good ideas about some further development. So with that, I will conclude the formal portion of our webinar if there are no more questions that I see and really wish you all a safe and enjoyable rest of the day and week. And I can't believe I'm saying it, but the end of February already. It's Sarah Stalker speaking. I'm going to stop the recording. Thank you, Sarah.